a good day to you. This is Michael Lighting Good, and uh, I want to welcome you to today's reading of chapter number five uh, of the book, The Wow Factor, More Adventures in Revival. Chapter number five is called Stoking the Fires of Revival. And our theme verse will be Proverbs 26 and 20, where no wood is, there the fire goeth out. Now, before I begin to read the book to you today, let me mention that it is available, uh, and you can get your own copy. You can uh, get the copy on Amazon, by going to Amazon.com, and uh, in the book section, The Wow Factor, and uh, by me, and you can get the book sent to you from them, or you can order the book on either MikeLivingGoodMinistries.com, which is a U.S. website, or a New Zealand website is... Uh, uh, doorkeepersnewzealand.org and both websites have a place that you can order the book and instructions for how to do that, the price uh, factors, etc. You can also uh, email me at Mike Livingood, uh, uh, at, I'm sorry, mclivin.aol, or I'm sorry, mclivin at aol.com or mclivin at extra.co.nz. You can contact me here on Facebook or you can write to our physical offices in either the States or in New Zealand and uh, order the book directly there. Any way that you can get a hold of us, we will be glad to get this book sent to you. Now, let's begin to read, shall we? Chapter number five, Stoking the Fires of Revival. When a revival that would ultimately run for 15 weeks broke open at an Indiana congregation, the pastor asked me to join him in tag team teaching a Sunday school class. The purpose of the class was to help people deal with the fire of revival. Proverbs 26, 20, and 21 became our springboard. It says, where no wood is, there the fire goeth out. So where there is no tail bear, the strife ceaseth. As coals are to burning coals and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. King James Version. We knew the thrust of those two verses was and is a warning against gossip. However, we saw a principle contained within them that relates to revival. The fires of revival must be stoked. Have you ever attempted to keep a campfire going? If a campfire is going to continue to burn, it needs two things. First, it needs oxygen. Secondly, it needs fuel. You must keep wood on the fire or it will go out. Those verses in Proverbs recognize that. We understood revival fire had been ignited in the hearts of many in the church. So our question centered around what must be done to keep that fire burning? We believed it was the will of God for the fires to continue to burn within the hearts and lives of those in that church. We believed it was God's will for them to continue to burn within the church itself. We believed if we could keep the individual fires burning, the corporate fire would naturally keep burning as well. The focus of this chapter will be to share with you some of the practical steps we shared with that church over a six-week period on how to keep the fire of revival burning. We understood the source of oxygen for that revival fire was the wind of the Spirit, and He would do His part. Our part would be to keep the fuel for revival fresh. We had to keep stoking the fire. Here are some principles we found necessary to do that. Number one, do not stop. And maintenance mentality. Have you ever watched an athletic team get so consumed with protecting its lead, they stop doing the things that got them the lead and ultimately lost the game? I suggest we be less concerned about maintenance and more concerned about expansion. We must be less concerned about holding on to what God gave us, and more concerned about giving it away to others. Two things are essential in developing your marriage. The first 
is that you keep courting your spouse. The second is communication. In a successful marriage, both husband and wife understand they must keep working at the marriage. Marriages can drift apart if the couple does not continue to do the things that keep their marriage strong. They value the relationship. They value each other. They keep talking to each other. Have you ever noticed the couple that can talk for hours at a time before they get married sometimes get married and then suddenly they cannot find anything to talk about? These principles are true for spiritual relationships as well. As the bride of Christ, I must value my relationship with Him. As the bride of Christ, I must take the time to communicate with Him. Revival may have the sovereign suddenly moment, but it also has intentionality to it. I make it a priority in my life. I prepare to set aside time to be in God's house. Things of the kingdom remain a priority for me. In a strong marriage, the couple knows what their partner likes. The focus becomes how I can please my spouse. Giving becomes more important than taking. In sustaining revival, I become more concerned about what pleases my heavenly groom than in what I am receiving. The more partners invest in the relationship, the more they receive from that relationship. Number two, understand the changes must be permanent. Revival will always bring change to a church. It will always bring change to the life of the revived. We must understand those changes must be permanent. The biblical principle is new wineskins for the new wine. In revival, it is not unusual that a certain percentage of the people will always wonder, when will we go back to the way it used to be? Some just want their church to be the way it was. They want the services to remain the same length. They want the weekly schedule to look the same. However, the reality is that some old programs may need to be given a decent funeral service. We must remember that principles never change, but methods may. Indeed, some methods must change to accommodate what God is doing. Not only will revival produce change within a church, it will produce change within a person. If you want to keep the fire burning in your heart, you must understand you cannot go back to the old life. This means you must be done with sin. Sin revealed by the Spirit and then repented of must not be resumed. In practice, this may mean some TV programs and lifestyle patterns will need to change. In the early days of revival, I noticed an interesting phenomenon. Because revival services were running night after night and were often running late into the night, television time became more limited. As the revival progressed, we began to take break nights to avoid wearing the people out and to make room for the other things in life that needed to be done. Some would flip the TV on during those break nights. It was not unusual for some to feel TV had somehow changed. Suddenly, the language seemed coarser and the scenes racier. Of course, the reality was that television had not changed in those few weeks, but the person watching had changed. Things we had never had noticed before now grated on our spirits. The way fingernails being scraped across a chalkboard would grate on our physical ears. Where it is possible 
to once again become dull a spiritual sense. Slowly, we can pick up all the habits and routines that dulled our spiritual sensitivity before the revival. Permanent change involves more than what we stop doing. We begin to add new things to our lives. Time is allotted for the development of the life of God within us. Our daily devotional life begins to change. We find a burning desire to spend more time with Him. That flame needs to be stoked. Fifteen minutes is not enough. Now we need at least 30 to 60 minutes of daily fellowship with Him. Attendance at church becomes more consistent. We hate to miss the meeting because we know He is going to be there. Priorities are adjusted to reflect our new reality. We love going to church now. We feel David's passion in Psalm 122. One, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Before revival, you were hoping for a short sermon and a short service because you had things you needed to do. Now, you feel cheated if the service is too short and the sermon is more like a sermonette. You start scanning the newspaper to see if special services are being held on the off nights in an area church. I even noticed when revival broke in churches, the types of things being purchased at the resource table changed. People began buying more worship CDs and preaching teaching sets and fewer cute t-shirts. This change was simply a reflection of the new priorities. More and more concern was now being given to developing the spirit person living inside other bodies. Now they were going after God. Number three, keep going after God. Often during the days of the Brownsville Revival, Evangelist Steve Hill would exhort the church to keep going after God. But what does that mean? Well, certainly, it included the way we entered the service itself. Half-hearted participation was not going after God. Worship became more intense. During prayer ministry, time to go after God included getting into the prayer line. We looked for those wearing a prayer team badge and requested they pray for us. Sometimes we would get prayed for several times a night. We lingered at the altar until the darkening of the auditorium lights required us to leave. Even this level of going after God must be cultivated. I found that I had to overcome spiritual inertia to receive prayer. It was easy to simply become a spectator rather than a participator. I could quite easily stand on the steps leading to the balcony and watch others receiving. And it's not wrong to watch others getting blessed. A secondary or spillover blessing is available. These could also be times of learning how to move and minister. However, these spectator moments often degenerate into spiritual complacency. I could become content just watching. I had to force myself to participate. Spiritual osmosis was not enough. I had to go after God myself. But for revival to sustain going after God, I'm going to read that again, but for revival to sustain, going after God takes on a larger meaning. Here are four things going after God came to mean to me. First, I had to develop a kingdom heart. The concerns of the kingdom of God had to be more important than the concerns of my personal kingdom. Scripture admonishes me to seek ye first the kingdom of God, Matthew 6.33. 
I needed to join in the prayer Jesus prayed in Matthew 6.10, Thy kingdom come. I found a new emphasis for Romans 14 and 17. The kingdom of God is not meat, but righteousness, peace, and joy. I urge you to keep going after God to make His kingdom paramount. Secondly, intercessory prayer became a priority. I heard Dick Eastman teach at a Change the World School of Prayer that intercessory prayer is love on its knees. This type of prayer identifies with God's concerns. It becomes more focused on the advance of the kingdom of God. Intercessory prayer seems to become more important in revival. If prayer was a vital element in attracting the presence of God, it is just as vital to retaining it. Not all will have an intercessor's ministry, but all must intercede. If you want revival to be sustained in your church, then elevate prayer in the church. If you want sustained revival in your life, do the same thing. Sometimes intercession is hard work. I have described it as blood and guts and tears and snot. It's not always pretty, but it sustains revival. For me, the third element in going after God is evangelism. We must have a heart for people. Rivers turned inward become stagnant ponds. Rivers turned outward continue to flow with fresh water. Keep witnessing. Keep inviting people to church. Learn more about soul winning. Pray for God to give you His heart for souls and stir your own heart for the same. Look for opportunities to pray for people in the public arena. Even before revival, I observe that often the people in a church who are the most alive were those sharing their faith. A fourth element of going after God is doing works a service. Jonathan Edwards wrote in 1746 in a treatise concerning religious affections that a full-fledged revival will involve a balance between personal concern for individuals and social concerns. He was convinced that religious meetings, prayer, singing, and religious talk will not promote or sustain revival in the absence of works of love and mercy, which will, quote, bring the God of love down from heaven to earth, unquote. Real revival affects our Christian works. As James 2.18 says, faith is reflected in works. I have noticed the churches that seem to sustain revival are often the ones that have made outreach and evangelism a priority. And then watch for the snares. Some make the mistake of believing that an outpouring of the Spirit removes all temptation. Do not be deceived by that thinking. In his excellent book, Feast of Fire, John Kilpatrick lists several snares that will come along in revival. Temptation to fail morally may occur during revival. Your flesh is not dead yet, so you must learn to walk in wisdom. For many years, I served as the camp dean for my denomination's youth camps. As a part of my responsibility, I helped guide the counselors during the week. Often on the morning before the last service, I talked to the counselors about temptations the students would face on that last night. I talked about the expected move of God in the evening service. I explained how students encountering the love of God would also want to express that love to someone else. Of itself, that is a good thing. However, what begins in the spirit can slip over into the flesh. 
So we talked about appropriate and inappropriate expressions of brotherly and sisterly love. We gave counsel to the leaders regarding ways to monitor and encourage appropriate expressions of love and how to intervene if they saw expressions that were not appropriate. I grew up singing a song that included the phrase, standing somewhere in the shadows, you will find Jesus. I would tell the counselors, the only people I wanted in the shadows were counselors with flashlights. I did not want some young person full of the love of Jesus to be moved from spirit to flesh with improper sexual activity being the result. I am attempting to be careful in what I write here. But immorality can arise in the middle of a move of God. I am tragically aware of a pastor's wife who became emotionally and sexually involved with a male intercessor while her husband was away preaching. The nightly prayer encounters became much more than that. Your flesh is not dead yet. So you need to set boundaries on yourself. Another snare is the temptation to be critical. In the middle of revival, you can face the temptation to criticize those who are not in the river. Satan loves to divide a revival into those who are more spiritual and those who are less spiritual. We can criticize those who do not worship the way we do. We can criticize those who have not entered into the revival as we have. Sometimes we face temptation to criticize leadership because now we know more than they do. During revivals, I have often pled with visitors not to return to their churches and criticize them because they were not experiencing the same revival. I have sat down with pastors who were being criticized by members of the church for not being spiritual or not being led by the Spirit or not being people of faith. And the list goes on and on. Sometimes we can be tempted to criticize things we do not understand about revival. I believe I should be able to give biblical foundation for the activities of revival. This is a truth supported by the apologist's favorite verse in Scripture. Let's sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you for a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. But it must also understand God may not feel obligated to explain all his ways to me. A third snare, which the revivalist needs to be leery of, is the temptation to pride. If he cannot keep you out of the river of revival, the devil will try to puff you up. More than one revivalist has discovered the painful reality of Proverbs 16 and 18. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. I must never become too impressed with myself. He does not need me, and I cannot survive without him. Another extreme is the snare of spiritual weirdness. Perhaps you know someone who is flipped out or is strange. A family member was pastoring a church that was experiencing some small level of revival when one of the men heard a voice he thought came from God telling him to go and march around the local school and claim it for God. It's one thing to go after hours and pray over a local school. It is entirely another thing to trespass on school property during school hours. His misguided zeal served to bring confusion 
into his own life and fear into the church. Often this fear keeps many from going after God. So how do you stay spiritual without becoming weird? Well, that will be the theme of another chapter. But let me suggest four things at this point. Number one is to be consistent with your devotional life. In the process of this, you should constantly check things with the Word of God. Because not every voice is from God. We are admonished in 1 John 4 and 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. New American Standard. Check all voices with the authority of God's Word and let all voices be submitted to that authority. Then I need to be open to and submitted to others in the body of Christ. Ephesians 5.21 enjoins us to submit one to another. Hebrews 13.17 charges us to obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls. The Old Testament passage in Proverbs 11 and 14 reminds us where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. I am not hesitant, even during revival type services, to check in with other mature leaders to see if they have a witness to the leading I sense in my spirit. Sometimes a holy huddle by members of the fivefold ministry, see Ephesians 4.11, is exactly what is needed. A third preventive to spiritual weirdness is to be well-rounded. Before you were born again, you were born. The reality is that God created the whole you and He is delighted with what He has made. In intense moves of God, we have learned that you need to take some breaks to do some things that may not appear to be overtly spiritual. Do some family things. Learn to laugh at yourself because everyone else is already doing this. Sometimes the most spiritual thing I can do is to play a round of golf or uh, teach a worm how to swim, go fishing. My wife once counseled one very zealous lady to stay home from a revival service and seduce her unsaved spouse, who was becoming quite suspicious of where his wife was going night after night. And then, beware of the deadly deeds. During the days of the Brownsville revival, Pastor John Kilpatrick taught us to beware of the deadly deeds. The first of those is doubt. Do not be surprised when the devil tries to cause you to doubt the validity of your experience in Jesus. Perhaps we need to doubt our doubts a bit more. If Satan can get you to doubt the reality of what Jesus has done in your life through revival, he can take you out of the revival. The second of the deadly deeds is distraction. The devil will try and distract you from following after God with all your heart. I have watched both pastors and parishioners simply get distracted, lose their focus, and the desire for revival slips away. And this can happen to good people. The deadly deed for others is disappointment. We are encouraged in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 35 to 36, to cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For you have need of patience, and after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise, King James. Even in revival, you will face disappointment. Not every service blows the top off the roof. And preachers will fall off their pedestal. 
Your expectations will not always be met. The next deadly D is closely related to disappointment. It is discouragement. Disappointment can give way to discouragement. Perhaps the person you hope to see saved did not respond. You feel like everyone else in the church has a great story except you. Overwhelming discouragement can cause you to give up. I love the gift of prophecy, but sometimes a long series of unfulfilled prophecies brings discouragement. You feel like the carrot is always dangling just beyond the reach of the donkey. You feel the bright light in the tunnel is an approaching express train positioned to run you over. During the early days of the outpouring in Terre Haute, Indiana, a preacher expressed to me he was experiencing the challenge of discouragement. In previous moments, they had felt they were on the edge of revival. But in every instance, that hope had been dashed and he was almost afraid to hope again. Discouragement was a snare he had to overcome. Defamation is the final deadly D to consider. While it is true, leaders are not immune to falling into sin. It is also true, Satan specializes in false accusations. He will try to tarnish the reputation of the leaders of the revival because he knows if he succeeds, it can stop a revival in its track. This is why scripture admonishes not to receive accusations against leadership without two or three witnesses. This was brought home to me during a seven-week revival in Wisconsin. I walked into the pastor's office to be told I seemed to be doing quite well. For someone who was in the intensive care unit at the hospital fighting for his life, the pastor had received a phone call from a concerned church member who had heard about my dire situation. They were calling to confirm the diagnosis. As we began to track down the series of events that falsely placed me in the intensive care ward, we learned the following. Someone had seen my wife and I out walking that morning. We normally walk around four miles daily. A couple of phone calls later, walking became the walk-in medical clinic. Another couple of phone calls and I had walked into the hospital where I was admitted. This soon became the intensive care unit where I was fighting for my life. Now, I appreciated those who were interceding for my healing, but I actually felt quite fine. I can laugh at that incident, but tragically, the same pattern of misunderstood statements can bring great damage to a person's reputation. A wise person once said, believe nothing that you hear, only half of what you see. Let's stoke the flames of revival, not choke them out. Keep the wood on the fire and guard against those things that smother flames. And thus we end chapter number five of the book, The Wow Factor. Uh, thank you for letting me come into your life today and for allowing me to read this chapter to you. If you'd like to have your own copy of the book, The Wow Factor, we'd love to make that available to you. You can go to our website in the States. Uh, that's MikeLivingGoodMinistries.com and you can touch uh, the button that says The Wow Factor and give you the steps for ordering the book. You can do the same on the New Zealand website. That'll be doorkeepersnewzealand.org. Click on the wow factor and again, follow the steps. Book is also available on Amazon. So you can go to their website and under the book selection, look for the wow factor and all of the things that are necessary to order are there. Uh, additionally, you can send us an email. 
uh, requesting the book. Our U.S. email address is mclevin at aol.com or in New Zealand it is mclevin at extra.co.nz or you can contact me here on Facebook uh, to request a copy of The Wow Factor or you can contact us by mail. If you're in the States, our mailing address is Mike Livingham Ministries, P.O. Box 1455, Danville, Illinois, 61834-1455. In New Zealand, it is Doorkeepers NZ at P.O. Box 31655, Lower Hut 5040. And uh, the book in the States is $20. That covers postage and handling in New Zealand. It is 25, which also covers all the postage and the handling. And we would love to make the book available to you. Thank you again for allowing me to share with you today. I will look forward to reading again to you the next chapter of the book that I want to read, which will be chapter number six, is, a, is entitled Living Outside Our Comfort Zone. Revival will challenge your comfort zones. So how do you live outside of your comfort zone? God bless you. We will look forward to seeing you again as we share with you out of the wild factor.